Is that only a week ago that we were Jack? Wow. Yeah, a lot's happened. (laughs) Been a busy week. Help if I unmute myself. No, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely excited about tonight's conversation. We're going to get into the nuts and bolts of some of what's going on in Trenton. I mean, so much so, I think we've done maybe about a dozen of these things so far, and this is the first time I have not poured myself a whiskey um, at the beginning. Um, And it's because I want to pay attention. I want to be totally zeroed in. Usually I have the whiskey and I just let our Dan talk and I enjoy my, my Wednesday night. But um, This is like, this is like the, the last class before the big exam. Oh. I wanted to all soak in. Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious about your guys' opinion as well, especially about yesterday's budget. Uh, it's, it's, it's like a horror show at this point. <laughs> you, 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 you know, it, I mean, it really is like a horror movie, really, because you're anticipating being horrified, um, and you don't know when the monster's going to jump out behind the tree or come out from under the bed or whatever. But you know, it's coming. Um, It's just a question of whether or not there's, you know, any entertainment in there too, I guess. Do you guys watch it live? Are you asking me? Yeah, I mean, do you you watch these things live? Sometimes I like to watch them after they're done if I have the opportunity so I can like flip and forward around and fast forward and rewind. I watched Jax last week uh, live. Did you? Yeah. I guess you've probably known Jack Chitterelli for a while because he's been in, he was in Trenton when you were chief of staff, right? right. Uh, I was in actually, I think still the authorities unit, but I was in the governor's office and um, yeah, I got to know him then. And um, he was, I always give him credit. He was the first one that really raised uh, the specter on the school funding and the disparity, frankly, you know, between like places like Jersey City and Hoboken that he's brought to light and how that needed to be revamped. And he, he, he pushed that first. Which one would think that's low hanging fruit if you're, if you're interested in talking about property taxes, but I guess there's a bunch of political reasons for that. You have to get into some comfortable, uncomfortable conversations, touch some third rails. Um, but yes, I agree. He was one of the only guys talking about it back then. Yeah, well, you know what? It's gonna be uncomfortable for all of us one way or another. So I'd rather be in a productive way. <laughs> <laughs> we get into, you know, all these subjects. So we get our, all get ready. New Jersey's a constant state of uh, discomfort. Assuming, <laughs> you're, assuming you're paying for the privilege of living here, like I know the four of us are. I was just, I was just having that conversation with Senator Mike Testa a little while ago about, you know, Jersey tough, you know, and like, we always have to like buckle in and get ready. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Mike, Mike certainly knows all about that. They threw the kitchen sink at him not all too long ago. Um, let's see, Dan and Art, have you, are you all shared up here? I'm shared up. Absolutely. I'm food. ready. Everyone has beverages, water, coffee, tea, proper hydration. Got some coffee. I'll and and I'm not even in New water. Jersey tonight. I'm in the other state that will be having a gubernatorial election this year, Virginia. Yeah. So, um, all right. I'm going to, I'm going to weave that into the conversation a little. Some of the things I've found here in Virginia Um, The more I travel, and I do travel quite a bit, the more I scratch my head and wonder why the hell can't we or don't we do this in New Jersey? And I think it's just because of the waste, the corruption, the notorious mismanagement, and the sheer, I don't know, dare I say stupidity? We've got a brain drain we have to deal with now too. Well, we'll sort of talk about all these things, Matt. Well, that's, well, that's, a, nice, that's a nice segue for uh, tonight's uh, guest uh, here on the Save Jersey Live because um, you know, uh, our guest is much politer than I am. 
um, but I'm just going to say it. One of the things I'm always astounded by um, covering the goings on in Trenton um, is how stupid many of the people are um, that work there. Many of them are elected before they go to work there um, by you, the voter, shame on you. Um, and I just don't mean that in the colloquial sense. I mean that in that they don't really seem to understand the inner workings of state government. They don't understand the budgeting process. They don't understand payroll. They don't understand market forces. They don't understand the, the implications of the legislation and the regulations, which they're in charge of pushing out uh, the front door of the state house uh, on an annual basis. Uh, maybe some of that is because so few of them actually have a business background. Uh, they don't quite get it. And the proof is in the pudding. Uh, we have one of the worst business climates of any state in the union, if not the worst. Our property taxes, you know, anybody that owns a home here knows how miserably bad our property taxes are. Uh, you know, just go right down the list and New Jersey always has the dubious distinction of being uh, in the worst position on any list nationally when it comes to our competitiveness. So some people are trying to do something about it. Obviously, Dan, myself and Art trying to write a lot about it at our respective websites. Um, tonight's guest has been plugging away at these issues for a long time, um, but in the past few years, um, she's launched an organization called Garden State Initiative, which if you read Save Jersey on a regular basis, or certainly more Mammoth Musings or the Dan Cerucci blogs, but you know that we are constantly stealing her material and using it. We always cite it, but we're constantly using it because it's, it's a tremendous resource for anybody that wants to dig a little bit deeper, pull back that layer of the onion and understand uh, the nuts and bolts of why the machinery that is New Jersey is grinding to a halt. So Regina Ajia, welcome to the Save Jersey Live. And I'm, I'm happy to finally be face to face. I think this is the first time we've been face to face, albeit digitally. Yes, thanks. Thanks for, thanks for that nice introduction. And yeah, I think it is. We've talked on the phone, but actually been face to face. I think you're right. I've had the opportunity to be with Art face to face and Dan, but uh, before this, but not you. So great to be with you. Well, you saved the best the for best. Last, that's for sure. <laughs> 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 the well, I gotta tell you. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, and I, I meant what I said too, Regina. I mean, I was joking a little bit earlier. Um, you know, I'm really looking forward to the night because we have people talk to Art and Dan and myself all the time is because we write about politics and you get a lot of talking points, but you're someone who has consistently demonstrated over the years that you actually have a core competency in this stuff. You get it. Um, and I, I know that you were... Well, I don't want to put words in your mouth. What was your reaction to, to this week's budget address? Oh, it was disappointing, frankly. You know, I think, uh, you know, it's a uh, breathtaking approach at a time when, you know, so many people need, you know, to be considered uh, by the front office as well as the legislature. And what got delivered was something that I thought was very political and meant to accomplish all of the political goals, but not really what the condition of our state really needs. And by that, I mean, what you were mentioned before. I mean, we're in the lower decile in every list that comes out about business competitiveness, cost of living, attractiveness for investment. Uh, you know, we can go on and on. And it just, you know, for my, you know, taking my understanding just didn't really address those and continued more of the same and accomplish the political agenda. So I know we're going to get into that tonight, but uh, it was terribly disappointing for me. Yeah, well, and we'll definitely dive deeper. But first, I guess, for anybody that's not familiar with GSI, um, and that's how often we, we cite GSI, because I said to someone earlier today, they're like, who's on coming on tonight? And I said, oh, the president of GSI, this is GSI, because I just refer to it as GSI now, because I'm probably writing Guard State Initiative at least a few times a week at Save Jersey. Let's go a little bit further back. Uh, wh where were you and what were you doing before the Garden State Initiative got off the ground? Well, I had two careers um, you know, before that. My uh, business career uh, was what I uh, spent out of college and up through uh, my time when I retired from AT&T. And at and I uh, had a very classic managed development um, career where I moved about the business, uh, both the consumer and business in 
the um, uh, network operations, the marketing, sales, again, on both sides. I started up some organizations. I sold off organizations, closed down organizations. So, you know, very classic management. And at the end, I was the senior vice president of business sales support for the global sales force at AT&T. And it was great. I really enjoyed it. But we were bought by a Texas company, um, SBC, who actually took over the AT&T name. Um, but we were bought by them, uh, and ultimately I left in 08. And then um, I spent six years in uh, government uh, in Trenton, actually as part of Governor Christie's team. I had been elected locally before that on the Township Committee, as well as the Board of Ed, um, and got to know a number of people you know, in the state level politics. And was lucky enough to work on the governor's policy team and uh, then joined the administration in 2010 uh, when he went into office as the treasurer's chief of staff and spent six years in Trenton. And we know that Chris Christie was, whether he was a U.S. attorney and then when he was in state government, he was always scrutinizing about the people he surrounded himself with. Um, so to have Chris Christie want to promote you to his inner circle when he was a governor, he obviously had very high expectations of you. And I can imagine him drilling you on a regular basis with tough questions um, and having very high demands of you um, on a daily basis, even when it wasn't budgeting time. Oh, yeah, he's, he's a great boss. And uh, he demanded a lot of everybody. I don't think uh, it's unique in that. But I was lucky enough when I was in the treasurer's office, the way I think we really got to know each other was I worked on the pension and benefit reform that came to fruition in 2011. And just because my business background, you know, I was able to both understand and articulate, you know, what it was really about and the financials in a pretty simple way. And it really helped a lot of people in the front office really get um, what we needed to do with the, the pension system and what the, uh, the choices were. So we got to work a lot together. And I think that really was probably the main impetus for me coming then uh, into the governor's office, first the authorities unit, uh, and then to the governor's chief of staff in 2015. So it was a, a great fun, uh, but it was a lot of lawyers. Uh, sorry for anybody who's an attorney, a lot of lawyers. Um, and I, so I was a little bit of an outlier with an MBA. No offense taken. I'm self-loathing, just like most of the <laughs> most of the lawyers, you know, at least the Republican ones anyway. I'm not in the Christie universe, though. <laughs> no, that's true. The, the, the Christie imagine lawyers really had, think highly of themselves. Yeah, imagine if we had a governor now who was talking about pension and benefit reform. I mean, yeah. we haven't even heard the words. And in fact, if I may just interject something here, Regina, the only time and I got a tremendous thrill out of it, and then my blog crashed. The only time I was ever mentioned by Rush Limbaugh was when I quoted on my blog, Governor Christie on pension and benefit reform, and it was in, in 2011. I remember that. And it seems so long ago now, Regina. Yeah, that was the first you know big reform, but we always knew there was more to do, but we didn't quite get a chance to do it, and uh, now, it's not looking like it's headed that way. No, certainly not. Uh, this budget, and I think actually your former boss and friend, Chris Christie, tweeted this the other day. Phil Murphy's budget for fiscal year 2022, $10 billion bigger than Chris Christie's last budget. Now, certainly you, you expect, even if you don't know anything about budgeting or economics or anything, you know, it, obviously over time, things cost more. There's inflation, this, that, and the other. Budgets are going to creep up a little bit over time. $10 billion. Chris Christie has not been gone. He's not been out of office that long. I know it feels like an eternity because of everything that's happened in the interim, presidential elections, pandemics. But it was only uh, short, four short years ago. Uh, that Phil Murphy was running for office and Chris Christie was still here. It, that's a tremendous increase in a short amount of time. Well, you know, everyone is noticing, um, you know, even Tom Moran and Charlie Style wrote about this, you know, yesterday and today, that uh, the escalation in spending, actually it's 25%. In the first four years, the, the spending in the state is up 25%. And what I find, you know, why I said really disappointed, this budget, right? Think about it. This budget went up 10% just in one year. The proposal is to increase spending 10% with no tax increase. And it's just very dishonest, right? I mean, this is, you know, we can get into it, but God, I mean, this is all about incrementally, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, spending on programs that won't have a funding source next year or the year after, because these are all one-time monies that have come in, including the borrowing that was done. 
Well, and before we get any further into the weeds, I want you to address something because this is one of the most common um, counterpoints I get from my Democrat friends. And you know, to your point about being a lawyer, I'm not just a lawyer, I'm a Camden County lawyer. So most of my friends are Democrats. And they always say, well, Matt, of course, you know, budgets are going to continue to increase at this exponential rate in New Jersey because we have to pay for all these legacy costs. And while that's certainly true, and that's something that I'm sure we'll address tonight as well, I, I hate that argument because it suggests that our current leaders have no agency over the current crisis. Somebody made decisions 15 years ago, and there's nothing we can do to change our trajectory. You don't buy into that. Never, never. I mean, I didn't, when I was in private industry, I didn't buy into it when I was you know, on the council in my own town. And I certainly don't buy into. I've worked in the you know, state agencies, right, for the state government for six years, and you can see it. There's opportunities for um, both economizing as well as, you know, classic reengineering because we've got too many people doing the same kind of work. And you know, I'm always quick to comment. By the way, it's not the individuals <laughs> who are doing the jobs that's the problem, right? The, people come to work to do a good. Most people come to work every day to do a good job. It's not that. It's leadership. Right. It's the leadership of understanding that things can be done better. And when you really are committed to lowering the cost of operating while you continue to provide good service, that is a principle that, you know, makes a successful business and it can make a successful government. And right now, I think, you know, this is what government not working looks like. What we're experiencing today in New Jersey is government not working. Now, you have some experience in making organ an organization, big organization work and work better, too. The, the, didn't it transform your division at um, at 18 when you were in at AT&T? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll spend a minute and then you, you can get into as much as you like. But uh, well, so I am old enough to have been at AT&T before divestiture. So I was there and during all the period of spinning off the companies and then the really reckoning that happened inside a regulated company that went into a competitive market. And I was in the part of the organization it was known then as private line. It's essentially all the high-speed services that uh, businesses use to connect all your uh, computing systems and with customers. And so we had a, um, it was a $3 billion business and we were losing $750 million a year. And that's how bad it was once we really understood what was going on. And so we had to get to a break-even business and we had to do it in two years. And I had the biggest part of the operation. I was the network operation side. So I had all of the technicians who ordered, engineered, uh, provisioned, and then maintained all the private lines in the United States. And um, you know, one of the tasks you know, we were given was how can we cut costs and improve service at the same time, which is not unusual for anybody in you know, a regular or private business, you understand that's what you're doing all the time. And we were able to, uh, by organizing the work differently and frankly, organizing around customers. And I think that's one thing that government really misses, you know, organizing around customers and who the client is and driving that into the operation. But we were able to take, you know, what were essentially smokestack organizations, integrate them into uh, teams that were organized around customers. And we reduced expense uh, 30%, which meant we took an organization of about 3,200 individuals down to 2000. And that included both management as well as the uh, individuals working, took it down 30% and were able to improve the customer experience and meaning outage time by 50%. So we took what was an experience for the customer of like almost four hours of outage between every time they went out to almost two hours with 30% less cost. So though, I mean, so that's why I feel really strongly about there are definitely opportunities when you're committed to a goal and you have to get it done, you can find those opportunities and everybody engages. And you know, it's a change for the, everybody. And I guess my last point is, I'm also a big believer in human resiliency. And that, you know, that um, event, when we went through that, these are mostly middle-aged men who were high school educated, frankly, that were used to working on frames, right? And actually soldering wires and you know, fixing things physically. And the way the work, uh, evolved to was you had to sit behind a computer screen and run routines and work in a very uh, software oriented world. And that's the job that they had. And by far, the vast majority of the individuals were able to transform themselves and really, you know, compete for those jobs. 
or else recognize that that wasn't for them and they went to do something else. But so I'm a big believer also in human resiliency and the interest in individuals when they want to do a good job, they're willing to change and they're willing to learn. And I think we need to give our government the chance to do that. But didn't you find when you moved over into, into government that uh, there was a lot more inertia there, that there was more of an attitude of, well, we've always done it this way. And that even among the individuals, the employees, there was more inertia than you found in private industry. Wasn't it a bigger challenge? Um, it's a different uh, sensation. There is, there's definitely a similarity in the sense of um, the individuals are caught up. They're caught in a system that's not working well. So, and they don't have the power to change it. So that's, you know, part of the problem, mm -hmm. as well as um, the complication, I think, on the, in the government side, although I was overseeing a unionized organization, in the government side, it's layers and layers of bureaucracy on top of people, right? Defining the jobs, defining the work rules, defining, you know, your tenure, and the uh, onerousness of both, you know, civil service, unionization, as well as political to overtones, right? I mean, because unfortunately there's a management change every four or eight years. So that really, I think, discourages a lot of uh, ingenuity and you know, high performance in the workforce, but I don't think it's the individuals, I think it's the environment they've been put into. And I think that can be changed. Yeah, it would have to be a massive change though, wouldn't it? Because in New Jersey, it feels as if this, uh, this culture of stagnation that Dan's kind of alluding to and just going with the status quo and, and not having any ability to think outside the box has been ingrained for a long, long time. And now we have a, a governor who is uh, redefining a lack of transparency um, to the point where even some of his, his media allies you'd expect um, wouldn't complain about a Democrat administration are up in arms. As a former Christie chief of staff, are you alarmed by how little information we get from the Murphy administration when it comes to their budgeting decisions, but also some other stuff, like for example, the lack of transparency uh, in the context of the pandemic? Well, the pandemic has brought it into sharp relief. I mean, I think there were always some, you know, concerns about some information that was being released, but, and, and, you know, we're obviously seeing in New York the problems that this can, can you know, create for, a, um, for an administration, but the lack of willingness to talk about, you know, how they're problem solving, what are, what's working and what's not, has been uh, very frustrating. I know to members of the press and certainly, you know, you know, I don't think you're seeing as much of an outcry from the general public because, you know, mostly people have been very scared and, you know, happy to, you know, comply with a lot of the, uh, you know, kind of um, restrictions that we've had put on us for a while. But I think now people are awakening to the idea that, you know, we should be able to understand this. And there's problems when people don't want you to see it. Sometimes there's problems like you're seeing in New York. Right. So I think the quicker, you know, there's an adjustment, although I'm not optimistic that there'll be a change. Um, but, you know, I think the, the, the more there is a chorus for more information and, a, and frankly, this, state of, I know you guys talk about this, right? The uh, continuing state of uh, emergency, health emergency that the governor, you know, uh, updates every 30 days is really getting old. And I think it's something that will come home to roost in the in the next couple of months. He's using those emergency powers as an excuse for not releasing information. He's taking a, a very obscure clause in the Oprah law um, saying that he doesn't have to fulfill Oprah requests Right. No, I, to the best of my knowledge, nobody was sued him for it, you know, over it, which, uh, you, know, sh you know, shame on the Republicans leadership for not going to court to, you know, force him to, um, to release legitimate requests for data and the press too, you know, and the, 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 the press, you know, that used to be the, 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 you know, the Gannett or whatever their predecessor organizations were would, would go to court to sue a government entity or the governor himself to get information and, um, New Jersey advanced media, I don't think did it too often, but Gannett used to do it all the time. But the Republican Party, you know, just kind of pretty much, I think, stopped suing after um, we lost the case over the borrowing that is funding so much of this year's, uh, that was supposed to be spent last year, that, that we didn't have the emergency. And, and if you go back and look at that video of, um, of that case where Senator Tester and uh, Mark Sheridan argued with the, before the Supreme Court as to why 
the this emergency borrowing should be allowed without uh, the government, uh, without the people's authorization in the referendum. Uh, all the 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 government the government's um, arguments, you know, just didn't happen in terms of emergency. Our revenues were pretty good throughout it all. Yeah, um, in fact, that, that came up today in the press conference that, uh, you know, for anybody who uh, had a chance to watch it, there was a question about, you know, uh, how, how is it possible to have the revenue performance, which on the budget that was released yesterday basically matches what the original plan was. The revenue performance is quite strong. And, you know, additional funds, the 2.3 billion for CARES, right? That's not fully been spent, but is to compensate for expenses associated with COVID. Right. And the 2.8 billion that's been given to New Jersey Transit. Right. Um, they've been infused with that. So how is it that, you know, 4.3 billion that's been borrowed can, is being applied to COVID expenses? How are we using that? And I think it's an interesting question, you know, that came up that um, we're, we haven't heard the answer to yet. And it'll be one that I think will surface again. And if I'm not mistaken, the budget detail hasn't been released yet. You know, there's there's agencies around the state wondering how much money they're really getting. He gave the speech and posted a, you know, a press release on his website, but the the detail is not available. There is a budget, you know, document posted on the treasurer's because I looked at it today. Is but that- it's not unusual though. Like things like the school funding, the um, uh, health, you know, care funding, those kinds of things take a couple of days usually to, uh, to get out so people can start. So that's, that's actually not all that unusual. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But um, the actual budget doc is in there because I, I went and took a look at it because I wanted to see what they were showing for, uh, frankly, end of year outlook for this. And it's, you know, very close to what the original plan was. Yep. Uh, you, you've said unless there's more borrowing or further federal bailouts, uh, we're going to face uh, probably a significant tax hike after the election. I mean, we we all see what's going on here with the governor uh, spending more money and giving out as much as he can and postponing everything. So, I mean, what's the chance that we're going to be able to borrow more money or get a federal bailout? Well, um, I get two things. So one is the the 1.9 trillion that's being reviewed now in Washington. Um, some form of that's going to come through, and there's going to be, you know, money that will come through uh, from that. Now, whether it's six billion or seven billion or nine billion, because those are all the numbers that I've heard, um, you know, but it'll be a substantial amount of money is going to flow in. But again, it's one time. And the point I was trying to make with that statement, Dan, was that these are all one-time funds. So it probably will be maybe more than one year, but certainly one year to two years. There's going to be a, a sense of euphoria, right, of being able to spend and afford all these things. And then suddenly the next year will come and there'll be no one-time, rev- one-time revenue sources coming in. And as we can all see, right, it's a $5 billion difference. I mean, we're basically generating $40 billion now on a run rate. And we just spent or just planned to spend $45 billion with all the one-time monies. That has to turn into tax increase on somebody when you don't have the federal money coming in. So, you know, that's why I said, watch out, New Jersey. You just got, you just got handed the bill and that's when it's going to happen maybe in two years. Isn't it going to be hard to make people understand this and particularly hard, for example, to make, I don't, I'm not asking you to get political here, but I'm thinking to make voters understand this this year. I mean, I've seen this kind of hijinks by politicians so many times. So is it, this is going to be kind of hard to make people understand this is in this while this money is coming in at this rate. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting because we were actually in the middle of doing a, some research I was mentioning to you guys before we came on camera. And um, you're exactly right, Dan. And frankly, most people are living their lives. They don't care about you know this technical stuff. They don't really care about the budget and pensions and benefits. What they care about is, look, I can't afford to live here anymore. And when I retire, I'm gonna have to move or right. I can't go on vacation anymore like I used to because I everything like energy, gas, housing costs, property taxes eat up all of my disposable income. That's what they care about. And that's what really gets people engaged. And I'm going to spend the year really talking about that with people and helping them see that there is a better way. Not only do other states do it, which is where everybody is to, you know, thinking about going, but we can change things here. But you have to you know, be able to ensure that the you know, political 
candidates, anybody who asks you for your vote, you need to be sure that you really want the same things and they aren't gonna you know, say yes to you now and do something different in the future. And that's a process, it doesn't all happen in one year, but that's what this is all about, really holding uh, feet to the fire. And I like to say cross-examining candidates, whether they're incumbents or challengers about what's their intent, what are they gonna vote for and what are you gonna do? So was that the major impetus of starting uh, or behind starting the Garden State Initiative? You wanted to give people uh, the tools they needed to hold uh, their leaders to account, to put their feet to the fire, to be able to give people some, uh, maybe talking points is a bad word because that sounds like it's leading, but to give them the ammunition they need. Well, we're absolutely, Matt. Um, you know, I give both Governor Christie as well as uh, the first treasurer, Andrew Aristoff, you know, credit. I mean, they very clearly observed that there was no one doing this kind of work in New Jersey. And you, you, many states have multiple think tanks doing this kind of work and really trying to examine and help enable voters, frankly, to understand what's going on and that things can be different. And so we talked about it all through the administration. And then I left in 16. And by the beginning of 17, I was talking with um, you know, the Manhattan Institute and Larry Moan, who's now a member of our board uh, and Garden State Initiative. And there needed to be, you know, another entity here in New Jersey. And we needed it to be though Jersey centric. So I was lucky enough to be, you know, looking to do something like that. And they were interested in helping getting it started. And that's how it began. And to this day, I mean, you know, our principles have been, as you guys observed, you know, one is nonpartisan. Um, two is we stay really disciplined about fiscal and economic matters. We don't stray into, you know, a lot of different categories. We stay on those issues. And frankly, there's enough work in that category <laughs> to keep us busy, um, you know, and third, you know, we try to um, do irrefutable research. And so far, all of our pieces that we've done um, have not been challenged or overturned in any way. And so, you know, we really want to have a high quality uh, and a high integrity brand that we've been trying to deliver. And, and so far, so good. Um, but I think to Dan's question just a minute ago, our challenge this year is to get out of the clouds, right? And not speak in technical language and try to help speak in you know, the voters language to help answer their questions and enable them to then be a smart voter and really challenge candidates. It's so, it's so important because I think a lot, of, a lot of those voters you described, Regina, probably vote Democrat, you know, because they just always did. And, and, they, um, uh, and they think that's just the way that it is. And they, they may not even, connect, the, if they vote at all, they may not connect the, their vote to the policy. And not, not that they should, you know, they're, they may be working, you know, uh, two jobs and raising, you know, two or three kids. And, yep. you know, the you know, government should be for the people, not the people for the government. And, you know, it's, I think it's really flipped in the state. And I think that, you know, um, you know, the government doesn't, is, is serves the government, you know, in, in our state, the culture. Um, is you know keep growing the government and you know more jobs for the government that's a, you know it's designed that way and just you know the people will just pay for it or leave yeah and, and that's very much uh, Murphy's argument he's pretty much said if you can't handle it go leave oh well, yeah he's invited, them. he's invited them to go and I, I want to just say Matt if people go to uh, Garden State Initiative website uh, uh, gardenstateinitiative.org and I know we've seen it, they've got a thing there called what we're up against, what we're up against, what New Jersey is up against. Let me tell you, if you go to this page and it'll take you just a few minutes to read it, I'm gonna say, take you like three minutes. It's a series of bullet points. I've never seen, I've never seen any organization or anybody do this in New Jersey before like this. Go there and read gardenstateinitiative.org, what we're up against. Let me tell you, this is this staggering series of facts that will have your hair standing on end to read what we're facing and what awful shape we're in. It's, Regina, it's really compelling. Good, I'm, I'm glad you just used that last word uh, because that's the goal, right? Not to overwhelm, not to uh, disinfect, not to depress and not to anger. It's, it's compel people. <laughs> it's really to compel people. We can make a change. 
And I really do believe that. And, you know, I am uh, bound and determined, you know, to begin this this year and carry it forward, I'm sure, but to really help, you know, help people see that they need to, another the other kind of way we describe our work is trying to elevate these economic issues into the voter priority that, you know, a lot of people, when they go to the polls, they think of certain things like I vote because I want, you know, strong education or I want, you know, gun laws or I want, you know, whatever you're going on. And we're trying to help them see that fundamentally, if you don't have a strong economy, you can't have any of those things. You're undermining everything. So you have to, you know, really understand what drives economic strength for the state and then prioritize what you want to invest in, whether it's transportation or, you know, education or whatever. And um, that's the other thing that um, is challenging, but I think people are ready to listen because they're so um, frustrated by, as I said, the cost of living and the loss of jobs. Can we expect any uh, significant revenue boom from marijuana? Because speaking of, uh, it, maybe it's not a one-time hit because marijuana is going to be legal now, or at least in the next six months, you'll be able to buy it. That's what they're telling us. But it's going to be a singular revenue stream, and they promise us we're going to make a ton of money on it. It's going to help everybody. Uh, it's going to help the budget. It's going to make New Jersey's coffers uh, just swell with, uh, with, with weed dollars. Um, there has been some talk subsequently in Trenton about dedicating that revenue um, to certain social justice purposes. Did, what I'm asking is, do you really think that it's going to make a significantly positive impact on our state accounting, or is it not really going to make a significant difference in the larger scheme of things? Not significant um, for two reasons. One is even the OLS, uh, I think estimates are 200, $250 million, um, you know, from uh, in terms of a revenue stream on the tax side. So that's number one. And so that, that does nothing to address the structural problems that we talked about before. And, uh, you know, so that's number one. Number two, I believe that there's going to be a significant cost, you know, to this implementation, whether it's, you know, preparing law enforcement to be able to deal with all the issues we all know they're going to have to deal with, the consequences, um, you know, in terms of the individuals, and then regulating the business. So the net net, I'm not sure how much positive revenue you actually end up getting out of it. I'm not sure that the, that the regulated businesses are going to do well. I think I think the black market's going to do better. You know, I, I, I think the way we've structured it is um, we've legalized that we put in an owner, you know, we're proposing an onerous, expensive system. And it's, it's, it's going to, and the attorney general said, stop prosecuting people for a small amounts. So it's, you know, the people who are using it are not going to wait until it's legal. And, and uh, the black market's going to start flourishing. Well, it is a very interesting point you make, Art, because, you know, <laughs> they're telling us it's going to be six months before you can go and legally buy pot at a state regulated dispensary. Six months is a long time. Something tells me uh, many of our uh, beloved fellow uh, citizens here in the Great Garden State like marijuana. You're right. They're not going to they're not going to wait six months for their next joint um, or bong hit. And We've even how do you know those terms right now? <laughs> I think I was in college I once, so although it was, a Catholic, it was a Catholic school, so you know, we didn't get out too much. But, but, but look, I mean, even then, Trenton's promises, right? I mean, Phil Murphy was supposed to get legal weed done in his first hundred days, I think it took what, like 1100. So, and then we just saw what happened in, in, in the legislature, which how much difficulty it took just to put this legislation together months after the people of New Jersey actually ratified uh, the whole concept of recreational weed. So, I mean, it, building upon Regina's point, not only is it probably not the revenue source that it's been sold as, but who knows when we're actually going to see it. May not even be this year. Even when you do see it, people are, you know, the, People are going to go into the, the regulated store and see the price and pick up their phone and call their the old guy that used to get it for them. It's the people are not going to, and there's no reason not to now. Yeah. And when you're making a bit larger point too, Art, about business regulation in the state, sure. um, you know, just to start up a business, we had um, one time, one of our forums, a, 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 a you know, private business operator, and they, they were describing, they were looking to set up an entity. And they applied, uh, they looked at what it took to start a business in terms of business uh, application in North Carolina, Virginia, and New Jersey. And uh, the number of pages that required to fill out just to you know, have a business entity, 
in in uh, North Carolina, I believe it was 14 pages, and in Virginia it was nine pages. And you know, you want to guess what New Jersey's number was? 150. Yeah, uh, 56. 56. 56. Yeah, compared to nine and 14. So I mean, we have this whole sense of that there's an a uh, everybody's gotta you know have their say in everything, and it creates incredible overhead on businesses that make it very unaffordable and unattractive. Hence, earning our you know rankings and all of the business evaluations that are done. And, and, and I then, have to tell you, nobody Regina. looks at and th then nobody looks at any of those pages. <laughs> does anything to oh, rank right. anybody until somebody in the government wants to come after you? Let's look at his file. Oh, you know, but you know, you fill out all this stuff and then. Go, nobody okay. checks, you know, and as someone who who's owned a couple of businesses in New Jersey, you know, nobody, you know, you fill out that stuff and there's somebody there who doesn't know what it means, checking off all the boxes. Yeah, you did that, you did that, you did that, you did that. They couldn't tell you what it meant if you asked them. But then okay, you have your license, you can click sales tax, you know, corporation, you got to pay your fee every year to, you know, where you don't exist. And um uh your your good standing thing and the, and, and judges don't pay attention to it either. You know, when, if, when I was in one business, if I, if, you know, the first thing I would do if another um, entity um, sued me is I'd look to see if they renewed their business registration and I'd go to the judge and tell my attorney to go to the judge. These people don't have any standing. They don't even exist. And every now and then it worked, but every now and then they just said, oh, that doesn't mean anything. Boom. Yep. Oh, I'm, get, I'm glad you guys brought this up, though, because, you know, we all in this group know a lot of people that are uh, business people, businessmen, businesswomen. And when I, I talk to them about the Murphy administration and New Jersey's business climate and everything going on, obviously they could give you a long list of grievances. But the number one thing they always say is that, God, I miss the Christie administration when it comes to working with business. Yes, they don't like the Murphy taxes. Yes, they don't like some of the regulations, but just the simple nuts and bolts stuff of how a business has to interact with government to be able to operate and serve its clients and serve its employees and generate income. It's so complicated. And, and the service provided by state government, the services have dropped off steeply in the past few years. And, you know, I mean, even if you... Um, discount the taxes. I would have to think that if you're the head of a corporation and you're trying to decide between multiple states, if the tax rates are fairly similar or there's other factors that could be a wash, how well Trenton interacts with businesses and services businesses has to be something that plays into your decision. And I bet you if you ask Nabisco or many of these other companies leading, they'd probably cite Trenton's inability to work with business is one of the reasons they're, uh, they're packing up and moving out. Well, two things. Uh, one is, uh, you're right. I mean, Nabisco actually went to Virginia because um, number one of the business environment, but also the business tax rate. So it figures, it both figure into it. But without a doubt, I mean, I think it's human nature um, to your point about the attitude of the government that's serving the people, that if you, you know, believe that you have to earn somebody's business, you have to earn a resident who wants to stay here. You have to earn a business who wants to invest here. You, you approach the work very differently. And when we were in, in the administration, that was how we were directed. And that is how we all acted, that we were there to serve, you know, and to deliver on promises that were made. And, um, you know, actually one of the legislators too, um, you know, that I worked with uh, from the other side of the aisle, uh, he gave us the greatest compliment one day. And he's, you know, what he said to me was, he goes, look, he goes, I, one thing I got to say about you guys, he goes, I don't always agree with you. And um, it goes, but uh, you know, what happens when I ask a question, I get an answer. I don't always get yes. I get no more than I get yes, but I get an answer. And that's all, it's very simple, you know, things like that, like respecting other people, delivering on what they need and, you know, understanding that we're there to serve rather than, you know, accomplish, you know, some political agenda, I think made a big difference in our administration. And, and speaking of a respectful tone, I mean, God knows Chris Christie has a tone that rubs some people the wrong way. I know that's that's a that's major breaking news for everybody that's watching this tonight. But can you ever imagine Chris Christie blaming Nabisco for leaving the state? I mean, that's essentially what Phil Murphy did a few weeks ago, I guess it was now, when we found out they were pulling up stakes. We're, we were very disappointed in them. We're very disappointed in their decision making. We don't, in other, in other words, as if... It, in a different context, Democrats would say that was blaming the victim. Yeah. But because it's a business, um, 
he felt free to do so. I mean, Chris Christie would never would have done that. I don't know if you would have heard that out of John and Corzine. Yeah. We're well, from Phil Murphy. The, we had the opportunity. In fact, uh, you remember Mercedes left during our administration. And in fact, you know, the governor uh, took total responsibility, said we could not find, you know, an agreement with the legislature to have an environment that was attractive. And I uh, did never, in fact, he, he accepted and, and, you know, acknowledged that it was our failure, not Mercedes failure. And believe me, they didn't want to leave. I mean, most of those people were born and raised in New Jersey and they did not want to leave. And we didn't give them a choice and we took responsibility for that. Yeah, and the so, young mayor of Fairlawn, who happens to be of the governor's party, is out there saying he's not going to eat Oreos anymore. And I'm thinking, yeah. hey, nope, stop voting for Phil Murphy. I mean, <laughs> it's nothing to do with Oreos. It has to do with your poor decision making. According to Forbes, New Jersey ranked 39th overall as places to do business. We were 49th for the cost of doing business, and we were 49th for the regulatory climate, practically deadliest. Now, unfortunately, a typical New Jerseyan would say, well, gee, who was 50th? We were at least better than them. <laughs> what? I don't even care who was 50th. Regina, how do yeah, we... Right. The real, how do we turn this around? Yeah, we got to have people believe that they can win again, right? They have to believe and it comes with, you know, the beginning is going to be small wins, but we're going to have to. And I, and I think, frankly, you know, it, uh, there are going to be some cracks in, uh, I think, the plan that most people think are laying out in this year. It won't, won't be, you know, huge things, but I think there's going to be some cracks and there's going to have to be some reckoning um, between the voter, as they say, and the candidates. And enabling that. It's got to be pressure coming from the voters, though. I mean, us sitting here talking about it is important and writing about it is important, but what's essential is that, you know, really activate um, voters to appreciate what it means to their cost of living, their jobs, and their ability to raise their families here and stay here and be able to raise, you know, see their grandchildren grow up. You have a lot of Trenton experience. Um, so as we try to advance this conversation, I'm not going to ask you to dish on or dump on any legislators because I want them to listen to you. The ones that don't listen to me are just never going to listen to me. And it is what it is. It's their loss, Regina. I am sure you agree. But <laughs> who, who are the legislators that you, from your time in Trent as a chief of staff, working in state government right now with GSI, that you can point out to our listeners as standouts who are great examples of men and women that can help advance this conversation? Well, you know, actually a lot have changed in a very short period of time. A lot of the legislators, you know, have changed to like Jack Cittarelli, right? He was there when I was there, but, you know, right. he's, you know, moved on. And we're watching, I think, a real almost change in the guard going on now on the Republican side, um, particularly on, on the Senate side. Um, and, you know, you, you hope that those are all, you know, experienced legislators, hopefully that get into those seats so you can be productive with them. Um, and, you know, and I'm, I'm reluctant to like, you know, obviously get into a whole lot of detail, but I think a lot of people know I've worked a lot with Senator Oroho on a number of issues. He's quite, um, you know, facile with a lot of the, um, uh, with a lot of the, uh, you know, financial aspects and the need for some of the uh, reforms that, you know, are, are needed. And everybody knows I've worked a lot with Senator Sweeney. Um, you know, I, I wish the Senator had a, a stronger coalition, frankly, you know, in the Senate, though. To build upon and more individuals who would support some of the reforms because he's been you know they are you know long long enough to be have maybe made progress on this and you know i fought that the caucus, the caucus as much as the individual for that but i think senator sweeney's been a thought leader and given oxygen to the to the conversation is, is that sweeney's problem because i i always i get very frustrated with steve sweeney for a couple reasons um and it's not because he's a democrat it's one i'm a south jerseyan so he's in my backyard. So when he does frustrating things, it, it, you know, I feel it a little bit more closely, perhaps. But also, um, I, I don't think he's one of the legislators in Trent that often votes the wrong way, but doesn't know that it's wrong. Um, there are many times I feel as if he should have spoken up recently, for example, to push back against these auto renewals of Phil Murphy's executive powers that are killing our small businesses. He hasn't done it. I mean, as someone who's been close to the legislature because you've worked in state government. I mean, what's the explanation here? Is it simply a matter of, as you say, Sweeney knows he doesn't have enough votes, so he's not going to pick a battle he thinks he's going to lose? Yeah, well, I think the dynamic this year has been very difficult for anybody except the governor, right? I mean, he's effectively neutered uh, the legislature. 
I mean, yes, yeah. I mean, it's really so. I mean, I don't think anybody's got a constituency now, you know, except for the governor. And um, I think you can look back on other governors and observe that that's a very dangerous road to be on, uh, particularly when you know if you have a little crack in it and something doesn't go exactly right. Um, you know, it can be really be uh, quite quite quick where the tide turns for the individual. So I think that's really been the 2020 problem has really been about the control that has just been wrested away and with a lot of complacency uh, from the Democratic side. I mean, I think the Republicans have talked out about it, but they have absolutely no power to overcome what's, uh, you know, really the authority that's been exerted by the front office. It's going to come to an end. And um, like as I say, much as we've seen in other administrations, that can, that can be very dangerous. And so uh, I think everybody's got to be ready for an opportunity when it presents itself. I really get the sense, I mean, that Sweeney has been quite quiet. Uh, he was much more <coughs> in the picture in the Christie administration. He was much more a partner, it seemed, and in the picture, and part of the a part of what was happening uh, than he is now. He he's I, I, even before this, it, it seems that he he'd been marginalized somewhat. Yeah, as I say, I, I think a lot of that is the the twenty twenty year and the change in complexion. I think um, you know the assembly. The assembly I think has changed quite a bit, but even since you know since I was there, and I think you see this going on in the country too. There's. There's enormous, you know, counter pressure inside the Democratic Party, right? You, you see, again, we've seen some. I think we're going to see more progressive uh, primaries happening, and on the, uh, I think it's going to be interesting to watch what happens on the Republican side with the, you know, the the fracturing that's going on inside the GOP and how much that really exists here in New Jersey. I can't tell yet. I don't think any of us will be able to tell until we really get into the, you know, political season, and uh, it's going to be a, a, you know, a a a, um, a rocky road. You know, white water. I think I've been calling it going to be like in whitewater uh, rapids, I think for, you know, quite some time here trying to figure it out on both sides of the aisle. And unfortunately, um, that doesn't create enough counter pressure on the current administration to really change some of the things that I think need to be changed as, you know, exhibited in the budget. Well, let's, let's play with a fun hypothetical for a second on the topic of change. Let's say that uh, uh, for whatever weird um, convergence of events, um, we go ahead and we nominate uh, Regina Gia to run for governor and you're elected governor and you defeated Phil Murphy and we swear you in as New Jersey's uh, second female governor. What would your first 100 days look like from a budgeting point of view? What are some of the immediate steps you would take to try to right New Jersey's fiscal ship? I know you can't do it overnight, but at least to start us back on a clear course. Yeah. Um, well, as uh, you know, a playbook that's, you know, always worked tried and true in business, right? First, stop the bleeding. So no increases, right? Nobody adds, nobody is able to do any freeze everybody. And, you know, that causes its own pain, but that is how you really get to examine what's going on. And, you know, and I, I believe that there's got to be the same attitude taken at the local level. So, you know, the idea of, of the locals. You remember actually when the Christie administration, a lot of people don't remember this, but um, you remember the first year in the Christie administration, the, um, uh, you know, revolt, I think I would describe it, it happened with school budgets, right? That everybody, there were more school budgets turned down in that first year than yeah. I think ever had happened in New Jersey. And so, you know, when you can get to people and they, they really understand their power that they can take action. And I think that is what we need to do: stop the bleeding at the individual, um, at the individual town level, which means school level, as well as the state, and really take stock of you know what is it that's absolutely necessary. And you know, pension and benefit reform. I'm going to talk about that first, not because it's the first thing I would do, but because everybody talks, you know, wants to hear about it. You know, it's something that doesn't create a lot of cash in the short term. It is a, a, an essential reform, and the playbook is already there. So, I mean, that doesn't need a lot of work. That's more the caucus and the organizing, the political will, you know, behind uh, doing that. Um, then thirdly, um, you know, the cost of education has to be addressed. And I mean K through 12, not the, not the higher ed. Um, we right now uh, spend 15% more than Massachusetts. And we are always ranked one and two with Massachusetts. And so 
getting underneath that, I think that'd be the first charge to the commissioner of education. Find out why is it we're spending 15% more. And when you look at the total numbers, that's worth three and a half billion dollars. I mean, we're spending three and a half billion dollars when you look at a per pupil more than we need to because Massachusetts is doing the same thing and producing the same quality outcome. So I think I'm not being prescriptive about what the problem is, but that's definitely an opportunity. And then the last, uh, the last I you know, would look at is transportation. Um, and that's really got to do with uh, expectations management. I really believe that. Um, I, I've looked at for the last year, some of you have seen my writings on, I think we're mishandling all of the TTFA and the investments that should be done in a more strategic way. We hand out money as opposed to target money to really aid the economy. And um, so I would look at more strategically managing TT, uh, the TTFA investments, as well as integrating you know, some of those principles into the transit, um, because I think that there's opportunities for improvement on the transit side too. So those are the big categories. It's where the big spending is. And you know, the first um, tax move, I would look, you've got to make uh, us more competitive. And I think incentives, um, I guess the last point I'm making is, the incentives are only necessary because we're so uncompetitive. So we've got to look at lowering tax rates, both on the corporate first, um, as well as on the, uh, on the individual side. And what that mix looks like, I, you know, I don't have an opinion right now, but we've got to lower them overall so businesses can afford to stay here and keep flourishing. On the subject of transportation, I, I wanna ask you about two Christie era related issues that are still very relevant. The first is, speaking of Phil Murphy passing the buck, he is constantly blaming the Christie administration for woes with public yeah. transportation in this state. Apparently we had a wonderful, beautiful, fant I sound like Donald Trump right now, an amazing, fantastic public transportation <laughs> system, no transportation system like in the world, before, before Chris Christie came along and underinvested and screwed it up. So that's one thing, I'd like you to respond to that. The second, when it, when it comes to mismanagement of all the money and the dollars we send to Trenton, um, as you know, during the Christie era, we had this transportation trust fund fix that involved a bipartisan deal. But I continue to hear from people on both sides of that issue, both pro and against, that it just doesn't seem to be panning out, at least insofar as they can't seem to spend the money fast enough and not a lot of road work is getting done. And it's just not, it's just not working out. They're disappointed in the final product. Um, maybe some of that's just a mismanagement thing, or maybe there's something that was structurally wrong with the deal. So could you address those issues? And I'd love to hear your our gas prices keep going up. Our gas prices keep rising at the pump. Yeah. Dan's also very pissed off about what he's paying for gas. Well, you should be. Yeah. Everybody is pissed off about uh, it, and they have a right to be. I'm sorry, Regina. Yeah. No, no. So I, I know this is a particularly sensitive subject with this group and uh, probably with your audience as well. So <laughs> a couple of things. So one is I do support the idea of that we ought to, you know, use those funds from the gas tax at whatever level and invest it back in the roads. So I don't think there was anything structurally wrong, you know, with how that was set up. What is wrong is, and I've written about this and, you know, I have enough of the evidence that we are not executing. Right. When you, I won't get into all the technical details. When you look at the annual TTFA report, what you see is a burgeoning, um, you know, capacity to spend that's not being invested back into the state. And I, I could, I'm not going to speculate tonight, but I've heard speculation as to why they aren't issuing those bonds, why we're not doing that at DOT. But we are not giving customers, you know, giving the citizens back. They said, I'll, I'll pay the tax. We're not giving them back the road work that they deserve as a result of paying those taxes. And the capacity there is there to do it. So it's really a managerial uh, subject, a managerial issue, not a structural. And then the last point, which I, I know I think is sensitive with you guys as well. And I railed against this this year and um, I did last year and I'll do it again this year. The idea that it's an automatic increase is awfully, uh, is awful. Right. And that should be revised. You can take, you can revise that, um, that um, you know, that legislation to make it an annual renewal by the legislature. It was really um, a criminal almost <laughs> that it didn't. But I hope that that will come back because I think it's going to be very interesting. We get to August, you know, the annual renewal on the gas tax is in, our, is in August. And if those numbers aren't hitting the 1.2 billion that it has to generate, what the governor is going to be, you know, uh, confronted with. Um, in terms of a year when he says there's not going to be any tax increase. <laughs> How interesting. 
How interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the automatic increase. No argument from from us, as you've alluded to, at least Dan and I. I don't want to speak for Art. Oh, I don't like the automatic, but I'm, yeah, I'm, yes, that's I'm, wrong. It, it's yeah. just another example. I mean, the legislature, this is what they do with everything, right? Whether it be uh, pot or any of the other stuff they've put on the ballot in recent years, they just they never they never want to have to make a decision if they can find a way out of making a decision. Um, NJ Transit, public transportation. Um, is it all Chris Christie's fault that the trains don't run on time? Of course That's not. what Phil Murphy told me. Of course not. You know, <laughs> of course not. You know, uh, and it, what's really, I think, interesting about transit right now is, and we had a transportation forum a couple of weeks ago talking about this, but, and Jim Simpson was there along with um, uh, Bob Gordon, you know, from the BPU and transit board. And it's really, it, it's a really interesting time because nobody knows what the commuting patterns are going to be really over the next couple of years and where this is all right. going to land. And instead of, this is my criticism of New Jersey Transit, instead of viewing that as an opportunity to totally rethink how they run the business and rethink the mix of bus uh, versus uh, you know, uh, hard railroad assets and building new railroad assets, really rethink it to be much more flexible and how they could create really a, um, a customer centric you know, transit system. And what I observe is, you know, they just got handed $2.8 billion and inside this budget that the, that the governor just, uh, you know, announced yesterday, he's crowing about because they have all this money, they reduced the subsidy from the general fund from $386 down to $100 million, saving the $286 million, quote unquote. And the fact is that the transit is not going to, is not being directed to change or to reduce cost or become more efficient. So this is another one of those examples, Dan, in a year, year and a half, those federal monies are going to go away. And suddenly that 286, 286 million has to come from somewhere. And guess who's going to get the bill? Either there's going to be a fare increase or a tax increase or both. And, and it shows you how little logical consistency there is with this entire thing. So to your point about all this money we're going to spend on NJ Transit with very little larger long-term thinking being applied to the problem, $2.65 billion. But we can't come up with $200 million to modernize our NJ unemployment system when, as we are recording this tonight on Facebook Live, there are tens of thousands of New Jerseyans who work their tails off. That's why they're entitled to NJ unemployment benefits, who still cannot get their benefits. Some of them have been waiting for weeks or longer. Well, I mean, other people have made this observation. They, 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 the legislature tied themselves up in knots about this, you know, marijuana and coming out with a bill that's going to have to fix the fixer actually, that that bill is going to have to get fixed. As you say, there are tens of thousands of people suffering, right? And, you know, they're good money after bad to create a system that's going to help them. Really? I, I just, you know, that's the kind of thing that I just find incredibly insensitive and that, uh, you know, we need to change. Actual quote from today, not going yeah. to good money after bad, talking about hardworking New Jerseyans who did nothing wrong other than live in New Jersey when he decided to shut it down for months. It's unbelievable. It, Regina, I, one other thing I definitely want to make sure we get to tonight, because I know that we've already gone over an hour, because we could pick your brain forever if you let us. Um, an under-discussed topic, and you probably agree with me, is this energy master plan that Governor Murphy is currently pushing. It's not getting a ton of media attention. If you read some uh, news sources like NJ Spotlight, even though I don't always agree with their editorial bent, they've got some great content and some great analysis sometimes. They've been talking a lot about it. Um, I mean, we are going to put a mandate on the people of New Jersey and businesses in New Jersey for tens of thousands of dollars individually, for individual businesses, individual um, property owners. And I'm not just talking about uh, the increases in their, in their energy costs. I'm talking about in some faces, actually hardware retrofitting their homes, their businesses to comply with these mandates. And Governor Murphy and his allies will not even put a, a dollar figure on what this is going to cost. We know that it's going to cost a lot of money, but they refuse to say. And yet it's a major staple of, of the governor's future plans for this state. He says he's going to make our uh, energy infrastructure uh, carbon neutral by is it 2050? Yeah, 2050. I think that's the date he came up with. So yeah, I, I know this renewable. is a massive topic, but maybe if you could just give us an explanation, as you're very good at doing, of what exactly is going on here and what we need to be on the lookout for. Well, I, I don't know that I can give as thorough an explanation as many other people can, but 
uh, I guess a couple observations and uh, art, this is to the point of transparency, right? This yeah. has to be one of the most opaque um, plans that uh, we have on the table right now. And Matt, to your point, it is going to you know, show up uh, in people's, it, on people's heads in ways they aren't even being you know, able to see at this point because of some regulations that are getting being put in, put in place. So the kind of the big picture, I would describe this, um, you know, five color, if it were printed glossy, you know, uh, report called the Energy Master Plan that is, begins with a goal of the 2050 all renewable and then engineers back to it, almost regardless of the consequences on the, uh, on the, on the electorate or, you know, on the residents and the businesses of New Jersey. And, you know, what I found most concerning about it is you know, it's a hundred and some 200 pages, close to 200 pages. And it's all about selling, you know, the idea of why we need renewables. And I personally am, you know, of the opinion that of course we're gonna move, move more to renewables, right? I mean, that makes sense for all sorts of reasons. It's always a question of time and money and not getting ahead of the market curve. And, you know, what this is about is forcing a curve into the, into the marketplace and spending money to accomplish that. So that, you know, the, the, the logic of this is if we have to get to this point in 2050, we've got to do this by 2030 and this by 2020. And um, regardless of the cost, which is why they're hiding it. So my big question to both the governor as well as VPU is, what are you afraid of us seeing? Right, because that is the problem. The examples, Matt, that you're referencing is that it's going to require people to change out, you know, oil burning and uh, natural gas heating systems in their homes. And the the the, the most graphic example is in Massachusetts. Um, the cost to do those retrofitting in a home was averaging twenty three thousand dollars. But in this energy master plan, it's kind of a throwaway line that only takes seven or eight thousand dollars to retrofit. And that's on the individual. That's because you're required to move to that. So these are um, things that are not getting you know, good exposure. There are groups that were getting some momentum before the pandemic. I think they'll pick up again, probably you know, this spring. I'm already seeing some of it happen. And um, the DEP is also starting to, you know, I was talking with someone the other day, DEP is starting to pass regulations that are gonna put all of this and codify it. And that has to get more exposure as well. So, um, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to get into the technical, like I said, I agree with, you know, moving to more, you know, uh, renewable energy, both solar and wind, but I don't agree with fueling it, you know, with, with rate payer money to accelerate a curve that isn't naturally going to be there because of the cost of the, uh, cost of the um, uh, evolution of the technology. Well, right. And I also don't like how they use fear to try to sell it too, right? I mean, like, for example, New Jersey's total annual carbon emissions is about three or four days. This is one estimate of China's carbon emissions. So even if you believe that we all need to pitch in to combat this, uh, you know, greenhouse effect that, you know, many scientists purport is warming our planet. I mean, we are an, a, a speck on the back of an ant on top of an anthill. Um, in terms of our impact uh, globally. So, I mean, you know, as you say, should we be looking at cleaner technologies where they're efficient and they're available? Why, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, but it, the, this same estimate says that it's probably going to cost us about $2,000 a year per rate payer over 20 years. That's a hell of a lot of investment relative to our impact on the planet. So yeah. that, well, that's the part about it I find most offensive, how Phil Murphy and his allies... Um, not only just aren't revealing the full cost, but they're also distorting the threat to scare people into not asking questions. Well, right. And, and you know, like New Jersey is primarily nuclear and natural gas. And those are, as you say, very low carbon emission, right? And scaring to point, there is a lot of trying to scare people both in terms of pipelines on the natural gas side and the general threat of, of you know, nuclear, which we've never had an incident in New Jersey. So I, I think this is going to become more and more, you know, in the lexicon or more and more in the discussion, because as this starts to, you know, uh, eliminate jobs, frankly, you know, I mean, that's going to be very real. We have several nuclear operations here in the state. Natural gas is also, you know, a fundamental part of our infrastructure. And, you know, where we can say a, a cost or lower cost for businesses when they're in the state. 
So I think, you know, there's got to be a lot of examination. And as I keep saying, what are you afraid of us finding out? Like, why would you hide so much of this? Yep. And hopefully we'll get more out on the table. All right, I think you had something to say. No, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a critical issue that in the, in the, again, the fact that it's so opaque um, is, is, is insulting and scary. And, but, you know, yeah. politically it's, it's really hard to get people excited about something that's gonna happen in, in 2050. You know, I, you know, I think you, you mentioned Charlie Stiles' column today, Regina. He used, he used that line about the, um, the Whitman pension um, mm -hmm. scam that he said that, um, you know, Murphy's replicating with borrowing today. You know, but, but he said back then, people were saying it's really hard to get people worked up about something that's going to happen in 25 years. But we're living now with the consequences of what the Whitman administration um, and the and the New Jersey Republican legislature at the time did back in the in the 1990s. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what leadership is all about. You're right, Art. Like it's people have to feel like there is a way to change things and feel empowered. And usually is represented by a handful or you know one you know strong leader that is willing to take on the system and make changes. Well, you know, we haven't talked about we haven't touched upon property taxes. And I mentioned that I'm, I happen to be here in Virginia right now where the average property tax is about $2,000 a year on a $255,800 home. Well, that's the median uh, price of a home here in Virginia. And our property taxes in New Jersey, which are still the highest in the nation, are like, what, over $9,000. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these states, I think Virginia is one of them, have a property tax on cars, but that's like several hundred dollars, you know. So that doesn't that doesn't come anywhere near closing the gap. And this is something that, and now Murphy went and got basically all but got rid of whatever was left of the homestead rebate. So what do we do about property taxes, Regina? Well, um, the, the biggest driver, um, biggest component, I should say, of property taxes is education. You know, and as I said before, that needs to be examined uh, for you know, um, lowering, frankly. I mean, I, I know that's, you know, everybody kind of rolls their eyes when you say actually lowering the cost of something in New Jersey, but yeah, yeah, we, we, need, to, we need to actually lower it because uh, there's no reason in the world why we should be spending more than, you know, as they say, a competitive state is for the exact same outcome. And I'm not being prescriptive about what, but I, first thing I would do is actually a cap a cost per student. You know, that no district can spend more than X dollars. I'm not saying what that number is, but no district ought to be above, you know, X dollars. Well, well, and why are we spending so much for education? Is it because of, is it because we have so many school districts? Is it because we have too many administrators? I know I'm in Cherry Hill where they're, I mean, they have a good school system and they will, then they will tell you about it, you know, uh, 365 times a year, every day, they'll tell you about what a wonderful school system they have, but they are saturated, saturated with administrators. I mean, why are we spending so much on education? Um, well, I won't give you a complete answer, but I'll give you a couple of reference points. So one is uh, actually in Massachusetts, they have several hundred districts as well. So, um, you know, it's not so much that we have the numerous districts, um, although, you know, they have fewer than, than we do. Uh, now, the opposite end of the uh, spectrum is, of course, New York City, which I think has the same number of students. We have 1.2 million, they have 1.1 million students, and they're basically in 14 districts. So there's lots of ways to do this, but they, but they actually you know, spend more of it. So I think you can, we can look at different models, but I don't think that's going to be the real answer. I think the, the, the issue that we've got is there's no management tools that are driving down the cost. They tend to enable just continuous growth. And by that, I mean, things like the 2% you know, property ca tax cap, I think you can put a cap on the cost of education as well, because we did a very small study. Um, it was very hard to do, but a very small study to just exemplify this point that we looked at busing, the cost of busing across every day. We accumulated all the information for all 600 districts about how, what it costs to you know, bus a student. 
And what you see is an incredible range of cost, everywhere from honest to God, $200 per student to 10,000 per student. I mean, it's unbelievable. And then for the mathematicians that are here in the audience and the middle 50% had a 200% range. So half of the districts ranged from like under a thousand to over $2,000. So you have 565 or 600 and some different decision makers, you know, sub-optimizing the system. You need to pull some of those things up at the state level. Special education, I'd pull it up at the state level. That's a big driver of cost. So there's some things you should separate. And there's some things you can leave locally that people really care about, like curriculum and some of those things that you want to leave locally and start to separate them. And I think we could really do a lot with property tax um, expense. That's one of the reasons I, I love what Regine is doing at GSI, because we're not just getting into the weeds with this stuff, but we're also looking at it and thinking about it fresh and differently. Like that right there, the whole idea of separating local control with some of the problems that are more statewide in scope. You don't hear anybody else saying this. And I think, again, bringing us completely full circle tonight, I'm just going to say it. There's not a lot of people right now in Trenton making decisions who fully understand this stuff, like our friend. Uh, Regina Gia. Regina, I think Dan already gave the URL earlier. It's gardenstateinitiative.org. Org, that's right. Yeah, I keep wanting to say .com, but it's .org. Yes. Um, you're also on Twitter, which I want to make sure I get everything completely right on Twitter. It is garden, it's GSI. Um, uh, is there a space? Right. Or is there underscore. A There's an underscore, GSI underscore New Jersey. Uh, Regina is also on Twitter. She is just Regina Gia, no space, no underscore. Follow along. I mean, again, I, I said it earlier, it's Save Jersey. I think, you know, a week doesn't go by where we don't at least cite Regina or something that GSI is putting out, which makes all this stuff a little bit more understandable and digestible um, for those of us like me that went to school and studied politics, so have no real world skills um, when it comes to tackling stuff. I know Governor Christie used to joke that, you know, you go to law school because you don't like math. So there, there, <laughs> there we are. That was, one of his, that was one of his favorite jokes back in the day. Um, but I, I, I had such a great time tonight, Regina. It required a lot of coffee, not because you are not engaging, but it's so much to absorb. Um, but I really appreciate you sharing all this information with us. Well, I am really appreciate all of your support, yours, Art, and Dan. I see you on Twitter as well as, you know, in different newsletters and things. So thank you for, you know, following the work. And please, uh, for everyone, uh, you guys, as well as the audience, love to always get advice and input as to other things we could be working on and doing better to help but everybody. Really so thanks very much for the evening. Jersey, a great service. So thank you very much. No, you, you really are. I mean, you said it earlier, Regina. I mean, it's something that was missing. New Jersey didn't have anything like this before. We weren't getting this alternate narrative um, of what's happening every day in Trenton. So we really, we really do appreciate it and everything you're doing. Thanks. Thanks so much. And, you know, if you enjoyed our talk tonight with Regina, please follow along um, at our website and at our social media channels. And as far as uh, Save Jersey's Facebook Live goes for the weeks ahead, uh, it's already going to be March, folks. The year is marching on. Uh, March 3rd is our next Facebook Live. Regina mentioned earlier, she recently had a conversation with our mutual friend, State Senator Mike Testa of the 1st Legislative District. He's going to be joining us on the 3rd as our guest. That's going to be colorful and interesting. Um, we're going to hit a bunch of different topics, a bunch of different topics. And Mike never holds back. Um, and then what else do we have? What else do we have coming up? We didn't get into this tonight, tonight at all, Regina, but on uh, March 10th, we have Bridget Kelly, who's actually running in Bergen County this year. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be one of the more interesting closely watched races and then we also have on the 17th, um, and I promised him he would have, we would have a green beer for him, um, even though he's Italian. Uh, State Senator Joe Panaccio is going to be on uh, our Facebook Live. And we're going to talk about a bunch of things with Jersey Joe, but specifically we want to drill in on the pandemic because he was one of the early voices calling out some of the Murphy administration shenanigans with how they're reporting certain numbers and statistics. And uh, he's also at the center of the uh, independent Republican uh, hearings that are being set up to investigate some of what's happening 
um, with the Murphy administration. And then I believe on the 24th, and I'll correct this if I'm wrong, uh, the one and only Bill Spadia of NJ1015. Uh, my friend um, and uh, easily one of the great characters um, <laughs> in the Garden State. I mean that in, in a loving way because Bill has an opinion on everything and it's always entertaining and it's always informed. Um, so plenty of great programming ahead for those of you who enjoy joining us. So have a great evening, stay safe out there. And as I think Regina put it quite well tonight, um, all hope is not yet lost. I know it feels that way, but we have smart people here who have solutions. We just have to do what we can to promote them to get that information in front of the voters. Seems like a Herculean task, but it wasn't that long ago. Um, we were winning that battle and we can win it again. So keep your chins up. Don't move yet. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Regina. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Art. Thank you, Regina. See you all later. Good night.